have been memorizing chapter 1 and verse 10, which says... Oh, Mariano wants to go ahead. In Spanish. <laughs> In Spanish. As long as you don't read it, but you can remember it. Okay, let's all work on it ne uh, for next week where he says, I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree. Does he want unity? Well, yes. So much so, there's no division among you, and it even gets better that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. So we're not talking about a superficial judgment or a unity. We're not just a unity in name only, but we're truly one. And we still have our own faith, but we just have the same mind. And that's why Corinthians is called the problem church. And yet he uses the word brethren, so what did I say, some 24 or 27 time, times in the book. So they are his brethren. He calls them his beloved brethren. And every church has problems. And so we're using this as really as a, a manual of how to solve church problems. And thank you, Lord. Because when he wrote it, he didn't write it just to the church of God. He wrote it to all the faithful and those who call on the Lord. Who would that include? Yeah, Paul is writing to you and me. Isn't that amazing when you think about it? Almost 2,000 years later, he's writing to us because he knows by the Holy Spirit, God has realized this, anytime you have a group of people, you're going to have problems, all right? And so we saw that uh, they had this um, partyism dividing over their favorite preacher and so uh, Paul said no you can't do that because these men they're just proclaimers they you weren't baptized in their name and so let's talk about the gospel itself and that's what he's going to turn to because he now mentions the word of the cross and that's where we are in verse 18 so let's read um all the way through verse 25, then we'll go back and talk about it. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to the, us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Well, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for a sign and Greeks see, search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God stronger than men. And so here we have this section about the message which Paul preached and you see these words foolishness and wisdom. And you say, what's this got to do with partyism? Well, it's transitioning really into uh, uh, another problem in the church that we're going to address tonight and it's elitism second but when you look at this this a uh, uh, bunch of scripture this chunk i should say when he says the word of the cross what are we speaking of when we speak of the word of the cross what's another term for that the it's the gospel all right because the gospel contains at its core the message of jesus the dying on the cross now there are two people that are groups that he's going to identify that respond to it. And it's those who are perishing and those who are being saved. All right? And we're going to see the response that each has to this message. And what he's doing there is going to contrast the rejection of the world to this message because to them it appears as foolishness and but yet to those that believe it's the power of God unto salvation all right and there's going to be the contrast now in this we're going to see since this group is always the minority 
and they're looked upon with disdain by the world, there's a tendency to try to want to appeal to the world and its wisdom so we can get their approval. That's going to be what we call elitism, all right? And that's really the root of the problem of, well, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, because what do we know about Apollos? He was an eloquent speaker. Would he present himself well to the world? Yes. Yeah, so we want to have a good face on the church so people will like us and accept us, because we're going to see today that the Gentile world, the Greek world, looked at Christianity with disdain. They were just a pathetic group of people. And so Paul's trying to say, that's the way it's supposed to be. Because when you look at their wisdom compared to the wisdom of God, one is foolishness, and of course the other has the power to save. So that's what we're going to do. And notice what he says. It is foolishness to those who are perishing. The reason it's fool or they're perishing is because they see it as foolishness. If they had open minds and open hearts, they'd have a different attitude. Now, we'll explain why it's foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. We're going to define those words in a second. And here he quotes Isaiah 29. That's okay, because I'm going to destroy, and that word means obliterate, the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside, I mean, do away with. So to understand this text, we have to understand some of the words that reoccur in this, this passage. First of all, it's the word of the cross. We already know that's called the gospel. He's going to identify it. We preach Christ and him crucified. So we're preaching the cross. And so they're all synonymous terms for the gospel. When you have the word foolish... It's the Greek word moros, see there? That's where we get literally the word moron. Now, that's not a polite word to use anymore, uh, except maybe in certain contexts. But when we were young kids, you called your brother and sister that, didn't you? <laughs> and uh, it comes from this Greek word, and it means silliness or absurdity or folly. And it carried the idea of unsophisticated. And so when it says the gospel or the word of the cross was moronic, they're going, that's just absurd. It's so foolish. It's so unsophisticated. Now the wisdom of men about something that's intellectual. It's wise and it's, you know, you need to pursue it and read it because it's complicated and deep. Yes. That mocked him. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. God does simple things. Yes. Well, in that day, in that philosophy, it was a lot of Greek, which was mythology. Yes. And so you were worshiping God to punish people. Right. And we'll, that's exactly right, and we'll try to touch on that later. If you didn't hear them, uh, the mythology of that day, the gods were apathetic. In other words, they really could care less about the condition of men. And they had a term for that. And they did not intervene on behalf. They only punished us when they were mad at us, all right? And uh, the idea of a god becoming incarnate in one of us is going from good to a bad state. So that is just ridiculousness in their mind. And so there's a lot of uh, reasons why to the Greeks or the perishing, this is foolishness. This whole idea, Jesus, the God um, as a flesh. All right. But when it says it's the power of God, that's the word dunamis or dynamis. And it's used uh, many t places as force or power. We get the English word dynamite out of it. So it, especially it refers to miraculous power or the power of God. Now, when Jesus walked on the earth, did he do a lot of miracles by the power of God? Now, we're going to see later that the Jews asked for a sign, and we know they did. They even asked Jesus specifically for a sign. 
He said, I'm not giving you a sign. Did he do signs all the time? So when they said, show us a sign, what were they asking for? We have to think, because he's been doing signs. They're asking for something bigger and better than walking on the water or healing someone. It's like destroying the Roman nation, delivering us, or command God to do something, then stand back and watch him do it. He said, I'm going to give you a sign. And what was that sign going to be? The resurrection, the sign of Jonah. I'll be dead, you'll kill me, but I'll raise, and God's the one that's going to do it. Because a dead man can't raise themselves, can they? And so, but there's the power of God. Then there's this word weakness that is used, and it's literally the word without strength. A is negates, and here we have a sathenia, or means to be strong. So if you have no strength, well, you have no strength. And we're going to see that word. Wisdom is the word we get Sophia from. It's the root for sophisticated or philosophy. Philosophy is the love of or study of wisdom. And that's the word Sophia in the Greek, which is translated wisdom. Uh, wisdom studies. It's a study in wisdom literature. You can get a degree in that in, uh, uh, in, in, in college even. Um, you know, have people in Athens, all they loved is st- talking about something new, something that was wise, something that was intellectual. And when they considered the cross, well, again, unsophisticated. And I'll explain why in just a second. So here you got to understand something also about the crucifixion, because when we set the table, we're going to understand these comments. Crucifixion, well, I'll make some bullet points. It was the most painful and humiliating way, humiliating way to die. It was reserved for the worst of criminals. And the Romans would crucify people publicly and, and, and to make it as a sign to the rest, here's what happens when you betray or go against the government. And would that be powerful if you, uh, by public display, they'd hang on the cross and rot there sometimes? The most painful way... And it put fear in people's lives. And it's the most degrading thing. And and actually it was said by Cicero, it's the most cruel and disgusting punishment. The very mention of the cross should be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, and his ears. What he's saying is a delicate person won't even talk about crucifixion because it is so crass and terrible. That's their attitude towards anyone that died on a cross. You must have been the Jeffrey Dahmer of your day. You must have been, I don't know who else, you know, Charles Manson. See, we're all dating ourselves. Is there anyone current? (laughs) You know, huh? David Craig, that's old too. You know, I'm thinking of someone this generation, some, Timothy McVeigh, yeah, all right. Oh, the Las Vegas shooter. It's for the worst of the worst, the child molester, whatever it is. And we don't really have a grasp of it because usually when you see pictures of the crucifixion and the Christ, he's in a loincloth and he's got this glowing hair and he looks kind of serene, doesn't he? And then people have crucifixes and it's a piece of silver, you know, uh, jewelry. No, no, no. The crucifixion is the worst of the worst. You didn't even talk about it in public. It's just not polite. Now, when you then come preaching Christ and him crucified, already are people going to be rolling their eyes. You're talking about a Lord, a a, a Messiah, who was nailed to a cross? (laughs) Get real. Something's wrong. I don't even want to listen to you already. Something's wrong. We can't understand the bias that they would have to it, and that's why they call it foolishness. So Paul goes on to say, all right, let's prove our point. It's foolishness, and God's going to destroy the foolishness of men, and this is going to be the only thing standing. God's wisdom will prevail. Because now he's asking, where is the wise man? That's the guy that loves talking about philosophy and writes it, uh, you know, talks about it. The scribe is the one that writes about it. And then the debater is the one that, do you know people like to argue? And they like to argue philosophy and wisdom. 
they like to argue things like that and they will just argue 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 and often i've noticed they win by out talking you not because they make great cases they just wear you out and you just go whatever all right and that's the debater now are they still around but the thing is where are they when it comes to a relationship with god does anyone stand before god can they talk their way into a relationship with god can they argue their way into a relationship with god no and so that's what he says where are they because when it comes to failure and success in the wisdom of god the world through its wisdom did not come to know god i don't care how many volumes you write how many eastern religions you uh a uh, a uh, uh, study how much you meditate uh doesn't matter none of them will bring you to a knowledge of god they never have and they never will um it used to be yin and yang you know what yin and yang is all right it's that circle and you put a s in it not for safeway or superman but uh and then one half of the circle you color black and the other half you color white that's yin and yang what does it represent good and bad everything's opposites in life good and evil up and down yin and yang now is there some truth to that you know, the other opposite in life so here's my question what are you going to do with that wonderful knowledge that there's opposites is it going to make you a better person is it going to make you know god is it a pain in is it going to empower you to find forgiveness I mean it's an interesting model and if there's anything true in philosophy if it's true you already have it revealed right you don't need it now it's karma if you practice good karma what good things will happen to you right and if you, if something bad oh see karma what goes around comes around is there some truth to that and that's cuz you read in the bible a man will sow what he reaps. Oh yeah, reaps what he sows. Thank you. <laughs> I'm doing that. I'm dyslexic with my words, all right? But what does that do for you as far as obtaining favor with God? How's it going to help you? It's not. How's it going to come to get you to know God when you know this little rule about karma? and it's appealing to what what are you appealing to is there some mystical power that's going to bless you for doing good you know it it's another philosophy of men that people appeal to because they it's sophisticated all right yes they think it is yes Right. Right. Didn't work. It, it, it work. That's what they're always doing. So anybody else have their hand up? All right. So, um, but here it is. God was well pleased with the foolishness of the message preached. What's that? The word of the cross to save those who believe. That's where He comes from. For indeed Jews ask for signs and they always did we introduced that a little and Greeks search for wisdom. Now one is one is an evidence base prove it give me a sign and the other one is a mental base you know they want to think their way through. Uh in contrast the paul says we just preach christ on a cross i mean it doesn't fit with either of those and so he says when we preach christ to the jews who are looking for a sign it's a stumbling block now that word stumbling block is the word scandal on which we get a scandal from now if we understand the back story of a cross is that scandalous and said oh i got to tell you to hear what happened what happened to john he was crucified. Oh, what did he do? What a scandal. And when you come preaching that your Lord and the Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament was crucified on a cross, oh, that's almost blasphemous. 
to suggest that God's Messiah would be crucified? It's a stumbling block. They couldn't even get past the message. You understand why? All right? And then he says, uh, actually, Deuteronomy says, because it all, uh, told them, cursed is he who is hanged on a cross, or a uh, 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 he that is hanged is accursed by God. Is that true? It's prophetic. It is true, Donna. Because Jesus bore our curse. He was cursed. He bore our curse. Galatians chapter 3. He bore it. He bore our sins. See, that's what, that's what the Jews failed to understand. They thought he was coming to save them from Roman uh, tyranny. And foolish means that moronic thing. It's idiocy. The idea of what? That a God would become a man and God would care about you? No, the only thing they're trying to do is appease the God and they would sacrifice to him to keep the gods happy with them or appease their anger. Want a relationship with you that he would send one of his own to die for you? That was foolishness. So with those two mindsets, can you get anywhere? No. And it's going to introduce what we're saying, elitism. And we have to define what that is in a second. But when it comes to uh, the wisdom of God, to those who are called, and every time you see the word called in the scripture, it refers to those who are called by the gospel and those who respond by faith for salvation. So when you see the word called, it's referring to those who've heard the gospel and the call of the gospel and had hearts that were open to respond in faith and were saved. All right, that would be us here and anyone else that hears the gospel. To them, whether you're Jew or Greek, Christ is what? Power. It's the power of God. And it's the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness, God is far wiser than any wisdom of men, and God at his weakest. Is it saying God is weak? No, but does God look weak when he lets his son die on the cross? Does that look weak? Yes, it does. It looks really weak. Like, save yourself if you're the son of God. They mocked him. You know, you can't be the son of God. You're dying. And so it looks very weak. He said, it's stronger than any man could do. So let's just contrast it here. Real quick, and then we'll move on. The message of the cross is so simple, it's sublime. There's nothing sophisticated about it. There's no intricacies. It basically says this. You're dead, and you don't even know it. You're dead in your sins, and there's nothing you can do about it. But God loves you so much, he said, I will let my son die in your place on a cross so you can live. That's it. That's the gospel message. There's no odyssey or journey you got to go on. There's no degree you got to get. There's no attainment. You just have to humble yourself and admit, yes, I'm guilty. Yes, I'm lost for eternity. And yes, I accept that Jesus is your son and he died in my place. Uh, I'll tell you real quickly about a friend of ours. Our, we grew up, their kids were friends of our kids. And it's a hard one. We just found out this last week um, that their boy grew up with our boy playing basketball. I coached them from the fourth grade up through until they got into high school. And... Um, they just found out he's going to the federal prison for 30 years. Now, I, I don't know how you deal with that as a parent. I don't know how he deals with it as a, a, a man now, 30-year-old. But what if the father could make a deal with the federal government and says, I know he's committed some crimes and he has to pay, but would you accept my life? I will do the time for him and set him free. Would a father do that? 30 years? Would you? I mean, if you could, would you? 30 years. You're going to die there. You'll never get out. If we're 
I would never get out. You say, that's the gospel message? Yes, that's all it is. It's so simple. It's, it's like I say, it's, it's stunning. Because you ask, why would you do that? Especially when you're God who created everything and we're nothing compared to you. We're nothing. We're just like scum, right? Well, no, not in God's eyes. We're his offspring and he views us as children and he would take our place. See, the Jews can't grasp that because they want a majestic savior that comes in with grandeur and majesty. The, the Greeks don't get it because what? Gods don't love like that. But to the person that is meek and lowly, that's looking for salvation, this is the most moving, transforming message that you can hear. You would do that for me? Yeah, what do I have to do? Just repent of the way you used to live, believe in me, and just follow me, and I'll take you home. It's that simple. See why to them it was foolishness? And to others it was a stumbling block? God dying on a cross? Oh, don't even say that. That's disgusting to say that about our Father. But that's the message, isn't it? That's what Paul preached. So as we go on, he says, you just think about yourselves. Just look around. Because now he's talking to the Corinthian church and he's asking them, just look around you. And we can do the same thing. How many of you are no, well, just to go in order. First of all, how many of you are wise? Any philosophers, a degree in philosophy here? Anyone has a chair at any school or, or college here? Well, how about then, how many are mighty? Are anyone governors here, senators, representatives? How about, let's just, mayor of Salem. Okay, you don't like that? Mayor of Amity. Yeah, are they, anybody here? How many mighty here? Well, how many noble? The word noble means raised uh, of nobility. Okay, and we'll see the contrast later here. He says the base things, that means uh, someone born of a lowly birth. You're the common person. You're the peasant. So you had royalty or nobility, you know, a prince or a, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? a lady. Lady, that's how they would give them titles, right? Uh, how many are there? Now, it's interesting. What does it say? There were not, what? And I don't want you to miss that. Not any. Is that what it says? Oh, you got to put an M there. It doesn't say not any. It says not many. I read this, this one lady who is a lady in some English royal family. He says, I was saved by the letter M. And that's really cool, because if it said not any, she wouldn't have had a chance, but she was one of the few of nobility that became a Christian. Will you find them every now and then? But not many. Why? Why? Why are they not Christians? Why do they look at you with disdain and think you guys are a bunch of simpletons following and believing something you can't prove, you're like those that believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Isn't that what they say about us? Because the message is so simple, it's not sophisticated, and they want proof. It's always has been that way, and it always will be that way. But to those who are really truth seekers, the message is obvious, and it's plain and simple. So God has chosen the foolish things of the world. What's he referring to there? The cross. To many people, that's just foolish. And then also the people. To shame the wise. He said he's chosen the weak things of the world. That's, again, the cross. To shame that which are strong and the base things of the world. And the despise God has chosen. The things that are not so that he might nullify the things that are. The despise it actually is the word. Does your Bible have anything different than that? I think that's the word where it says those of lowly birth. They're despised. Just a commoner. And that's what the church back then was populated with. Just your good old Joe and Betty, the people, the farmers, the merchants, just the good salt of the earth people. That's who received Jesus. And those are the ones that received the teachings of Christ by the mouth of the apostles. The things that are not. It's interesting, 
the, the nobodies would be the despised, the non-existent, the things that are not. I read that was the most contemptible expression in Greek language to demean another person. It's to say you are a thing that is not. It's as if you don't exist. But isn't that who God calls? The poor in spirit, the humble? Those are the ones that respond to him. And the reason God has done this way, because he doesn't want anyone boasting on their own merit, their own intellect, their own nobility, their own strength, their wisdom. That's not what's going to get you to heaven. The only thing that's going to get you to heaven is when you fall on your face before the cross and say, that should have been me. I should have been on there. Thank you. I'll do whatever you ask. And see, this group of people can't humble themselves because of what? If I use one word, what would it be? Elitism. Elitism. Or they have this pride that we're going to talk about now. And it was infiltrating the church back then. And so here again, this is Celsus in AD 178. Here's what he writes about Christians, talking about the lowly, the base. He says, let no cultured person draw near, none wise, none sensible, for all that kind of thing we count evil. But if any man is ignorant, if any man is waiting in sense and culture, if any is a fool, let him come boldly. He's talking about to Christians and to Christianity. But if you're wise or sensible, you know, don't come, all right? I mean, we see in their own houses, wool dressers, cobblers, and fullers, the most uneducated and vulgar persons. Isn't that what Paul said would be there? He says, when you look at Christians, that's who you see, uneducated people. He said that Christians were like a swarm of bats or ants creeping out of their nests or frogs holding a symposium around a swamp. That's a good word picture, isn't it? Croak, croak. <laughs> Are worms and conventional in a corner of mud. They disdained Christianity. That's why they persecute them. It was illegal to gather until Constantine in 300 AD, quote, converted, became a Christian, outlawed crucifixion for the first time, and Christianity turned to be in vogue. But for the first 300 years, they were the, the despised, the lowly, and the shame. Why? Because Christianity was foolishness. To the world. There's foolishness. Has anything changed today? No. But to us who believe, it's the power of God. Now, Jesus did a lot of miracles, but I would suggest to you the greatest miracle is Jesus Christ Himself. It's not supernatural in the sense that He walked in water, but it's supernatural in the fact that God came one of us. Born of a virgin. And he didn't take a lofty person. He was born of lowly birth. And he lived a lowly, humble life. And he ate and drank with the publicans and the sinners. And people scorned him for those who he chose to associate with. The miracle of Christ is who he was and who he loved. The miracle of Christ is that he came and healed anyone that came to him and just asked for mercy. The power of Christ is that if you come to him with faith and repentance, he'll save you from your sins and he'll transform your life. People from the basis of lifestyles going to prison have totally changed their life just by coming before the cross and asking for mercy. The power of Christ is the miracle. It's Jesus. And we know that, don't we? And that's why we don't boast in ourselves. We don't boast in any philosophy. We him and him crucified. And the fact that he loved me enough to die and suffer for me. That's the miracle. Isn't it? And that's why we're here on a rainy, cold Wednesday night. Because we know we're going to heaven when he comes. It's nothing we've done. It's everything that he's done for us. It's the simplicity of the gospel message. If you want to convert Christ and bring people to Christ and save a dying world, that's the only message. It's not about getting apologetics. It's not about convincing him there is a God. It's not about convincing him that, or that person, that the Bible's all true. 
It's convincing him that they're going to die in their sins. There is a life after death, and Jesus came to save you from that. He took your place. Would you just accept him? That's what it is. Now, I know all that's necessary to set up foundation, but that's the power of Christ, isn't it, that saves? Nothing more and nothing less. And that's what he says here. So consider your calling. By his doing, you are in Christ. And you have become to us, humble collectively, the church of Corinth, and to us who he's writing also. You're the wisdom of God. The fact that we're here shows that God's wisdom is work. People from, we would never associate together before, would we? We wouldn't know each other. People from Lebanon, Salem, and Kaiser, and outlying areas, we would never know each other if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. Is that not true? I mean, there are some relatives here, but you probably wouldn't even like each other if it wasn't for Christ, right? <laughs> You are the wisdom of God. You are the, his righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen? Now, why is he, he has this big treatise in this sermon on the power of the message of the cross of Christ? It's because they're getting away from that. Elitism, it's lonely at the top, but it's comforting to look down upon everyone at the bottom. I got to kind of like that. I found that one. Now, our theme is no divisions, right? You all agree, same mind, same judgment. But now he's going to deal with this elitist attitude because the Christians are feeling this snobbery, this disdain, and they want to be accepted by the world. They want to be accepted by their peers, so we need the best speakers there can be. We need the Apollos. We need the eloquent person to be the face of the church so those who disdain us might look at us more favorably because we don't want to be looked down upon. And then internally, there's elitist attitude. We want to rise above other Christians that we're more sophisticated than the rest. Is that always been the case in any collective group, church or not? There are some that want to rise up above others. That's what was happening at the Corinthian church, and it, that same character or attitude has to be dealt with in today's generation as well. Partyism, that's where we started, has at its root pride, and it's a love for the wisdom of men, and it's love for the praise of men. Those two things. I want to be praised by others, and I want to appear as wise. But both challenge the wisdom of God, because the wisdom of God says you got to what? Be wise? No, you got to be humble. You got to be powerful? No, you got to be low. The wisdom of God says what? Fall on your face. The wisdom of men says stand up above others. Totally opposite, aren't they? And it's pride. So in chapter 4 and verse 6, a preview, it's the end of this section. Here's what Paul writes. Now these sayings, chapter 1 through chapter 4, I've written and figuratively applied to myself for your sake that you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that none of you will become arrogant. And what? Puffed up or on behalf of one another. What's Paul fighting? Snobbery in the church. This, this, this attitude that I want to be, you know, top dog or elite. Because after all, who's in that church with them? That body of Christ. Slaves, you know, peasants, the lowly workers, the people that are disabled. Why are they coming to Christ? Because they need him just as bad as everyone. And there's this attitude. You see what's going on? That's why in chapter 12 he'll say, we're all members of the same body. We've got to have the same care. So let's look at it real quick and we'll be done. I like this as my definition. Elitism is the art of being snobby. All right? Is that, does that work? Have you ever known anyone had that characteristic about them? And it, you just know it. It's just the way they dress. It's the way they hold themselves. It's the way they talk. Now, I don't want to judge hearts, but you, do you know snobbiness when you see it and hear it? Yes. There's no room for that in the church. Was Jesus in any sense a snob? He was the opposite of that, all right? And so we see Paul says, when I came to you, brethren, he said, I'm, let's talk about how I came. 
verse 1 of chapter 2. I did not come with superiority or of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Superiority means elevated. It's a word that's used for mountaintops. That I didn't speak on this high plane. Is everyone, anyone listen to a preacher that uses really, really, really big words? And they just wow you with their, their mastery of the English vocabulary? That's certainly not me. Because <laughs> I can't even pronounce words right. Maybe my grammar much less. And should you have a good, uh, uh, um, I can't even think of words. Should you know the English language well if you're going to be a public speaker? Should you have good grammar? Yes. Because if you sound like an uneducated hick, people aren't going to listen to you. That's been my challenge all the time, all right? All right? I was being serious, too. But Paul says, I didn't come to you with elevated speech. It wasn't flamboyant. It wasn't like, whoa, he is so fun to listen to. He said, I didn't come to you. I knew one thing. I came and proclaimed to you the testimony of God or the witness of God, and I knew nothing except one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. I preached the word of cross. Wow. It's humbling, but it's powerful. He said, that's all I preached. And you know it, he says. I came to you first in Acts 18. He came as a witness. That's a testimony. And he didn't win him with superior preach, but he knew nothing but Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. My message was not in persuasive words. Now, you got to be careful. Did Paul use scripture to persuade men that Jesus was the Christ? All right? But he didn't use his own power. Can certain people sell you a... Uh, What's the proverbial thing? They could sell you a refrigerator in Alaska or a twin Eskimo. What are the other ones? Huh? The Brooklyn Bridge. Some people have that silvery tongue, and they could sell you anything. Is that what Paul did? No, he just preached Jesus Christ, and if you want to come, come. Most didn't, but a few did. Okay? And I came uh, not in persuasive words. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry. Why? So your faith would not rest on me, but what? Wisdom of God. Then real quickly, he says, we don't speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom not of the sage, nor the ruler's sage who are passed away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined for the ages of our glory, the wisdom which the none of the people of this, rulers of this age had understood, speaking of the Jews, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified our Lord. See, so again, they were looking for some sophisticated, glorious king to come along. When Jesus came along and allowed himself to die on a cross, they go, oh, that's our proof that he isn't the son of God. See how they were thinking? That's our proof. They didn't realize they were playing right into God's hands. So verse uh, 7 and 8, and we're done. Just as written, things which the eye has not seen and the ear has not heard, which we have entered in the heart of man, God is all that God has prepared for those who love him. Then we find, he says, oh, I'm going to stop right there because that's going to introduce another thought. So let's wrap it up. Is God's message very simple? If we preach Christ and him crucified effectively, is it powerful? It is. And can anyone grasp it and understand it? It's just as simple as Christ came and said, I want to take your place. That's it. Now you out of gratitude and faith got to follow him the rest of your life. That's it. Don't go back to what he saved you from. Don't end up in jail again. Wouldn't that make a mockery of his, his sacrifice? If the father went to jail for his son and his son got back involved in the same lifestyle and ended up in jail with his dad? Wouldn't it be terrible? What a slap in his face. So Jesus is saying, repent and just follow me. Do the best you can. Just don't ever quit. I'll forgive you and I'll forgive you and I'll forgive you. And when I come again, I'll take you home to salvation. That's the power of the gospel. And that's why we're here. Any comments or questions? All right. Okay, we'll stop right there. Yeah.